Well, welcome everybody. Welcome back. This is our second uh, second month in a row here doing an educational workshop or webinar here for uh, investors or prospective investors uh, in King Operating Fund uh, 4, 3 and 4, or Program 3, Program 4. Um, but this is not about that. So we're, we're, we're more than happy to answer phone calls, uh, very transparent business. We're, we're more than happy to, uh, to give you updates. We're certainly going to have those coming out to you in the next week or two um, in our first quarterly business review in the next month. Uh, before we get into that stuff, I will let you know that we are absolutely excited about our board and county project. So if you're in on that project right now, I think you're going to be very happy. But again, the, the dirt will tell all the truth. So we won't know what we don't know until we are, uh, we are fully in the ground. So let's get started here on uh, basic economics and what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, you'll see me turn my head from side to side because I'm in the middle of our conference room here at work. So we have some people walking by end of the day. Uh, but thank you all for joining us uh, tonight. My name is Eric Rice. I'm the chief growth officer here at King Operating. And what these events are every month is we're just simply trying to get in front of as many people as possible, give you some factual information about what's happening in the world that you're probably not going to hear in the mainstream media. Um, I'd be more than happy to back up anything that I tell you with evidence and proof. I actually have some of it in front of me because some of it sounds unbelievable, but it's actually happening in our world uh, as we speak. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is get through a few basic topics here in the next 30 minutes and then open it up for Q&A for 15 or 20 minutes. And then we'll all, all get to go to dinner with our families and, and enjoy what uh, God intended us to enjoy, which is time with our loved ones. So there are a lot of things that are happening around the world right now that I'm sure don't make it that make as little sense to you as they make to me. And this is what I spend a, a good portion of my day on is obviously growing, helping raise capital here, but at the same time, also market strategies and understanding what's happening in the markets, what, what's coming next uh, is what any good investor uh, wants to know. But as much as information as there is in the world, very, very heavy and copious amounts of the information we see can be misleading, misunderstood, or miscalculated. Um, so I spend a lot of time going through actual GDP reports, uh, government releases on topics. And to be honest with you, none of it's making any sense to me. Uh, one of the things that doesn't make sense, major topic I'm going to cover tonight. And by the way, as I get started here, the opinions on this, this webinar are mine and not that of King Operating. Um, so this is just something I do voluntarily. I have my own, well, I had my own podcast, which I'm starting up again in uh, April when we move into our new office. But uh, I've been doing this stuff for a long time, uh, nightly watching what's happening in the world, seeing the news that the news doesn't cover, and being able to see trends in the market before they occur. And the trends right now, to me, uh, are very simple to see, which is why I'm in oil and gas, why I'm, why I'm here at King. Uh, I believe in what we're doing. I believe that, that the hydrocarbon market or oil and gas market uh, is the future of energy for the next 25 to 30 years, not 10 years, as President Biden stated earlier in the month. Uh, so I'm going to go through that. So a major topic I'm going to cover here, since a lot of you are investors in the fund, is natural gas. Uh, natural gas is something that people just don't talk about. You know, we talk about the price of oil quite a bit, but the price of natural gas right now is sort of a, a statistical anomaly. So I'm going to go through that after I set the table a little bit with some information that will help you understand the information I'll give you on natural gas. So let's look at the market as a whole. You know, markets predominantly, there's a fundamental saying in America that the, the consumer drives the investment. So if you invest in a public company that sells wagons, right? People have to have enough money to buy wagons. If you're investing in a company that builds technology, people have, have, have to have enough money to buy the technology or use the technology. So we're finding ourselves in a very strange situation historically that is not being covered in any sort of real meaningful way in the, in the actual news. And that's what you know, my, myself and many other people around the country are trying to do is to share this information with you. So I'm going to start in something that's probably most familiar to a lot of you on here tonight, which is the real estate market. You know, we keep hearing that inflation's going down, that jobs are going up, that, you know, uh, interest rates are going to go back down. None of these things are true. Uh, they're statistically not true. Um, you know, I see this stuff all the time. So I'm going to start in real estate and, and, and set the background when it comes to inflation and the general overall economy. These are stats that I pulled up right before this. So two years ago, the average mortgage rate was 2.83%. Two years ago, 2.83%. Today, as of February 17th, the average mortgage rate for a 30-year fixed is 6.8%. That's a significant increase. You're looking at more than 2x increase in price. So how does this affect the American economy, the American consumer, which is what we should be paying attention to? Well, here's some stats. In 2020, we had an average home price of $391,000. Okay, so in 2020, you could buy the average American home for $391,000, put 10% down and get a 2.83% mortgage. 
that would give you a $1,485 a month monthly payment on your home. Very affordable for many people around the country, uh, very affordable for almost every average American family. Now let's fast forward into February 17th of this year. So February 17th of this year, right now, as we, in, in the reality we sit in, the average mortgage rate is 6.8%. And the average home value, the average home value is $543,600. So again, if we assume that a buyer will put 10% down on their home, finance the rest at 6.8%, the, the, this means the average American home payment has gone from $1,485 to $3,194. That's a 115% increase for a new home buyer buying the new, again, these are average prices nationwide. Now we're seeing really big problems in the, in the, in the real estate space. The numbers that came out yesterday were 37% decrease in existing home sales. That's the lowest number since 2008. Uh, last month, I went through the stock market pretty heavily and explaining that if you overlay the stock market charts of the S&P 500, you will see a pretty much a repeat pattern from the Great Depression to 1987 to 2008 and now 2023. The chart patterns are exactly the same. So something big is definitely coming. And I say this because you know, you're seeing quite often now on CNBC and some of these other financial networks, uh, on occasion you get an analyst on there talking about black swan events, which is, you know, COVID was a black swan event, right? All the global economies shut down for the better part of six months. And that caused a lot of economic devastation. We're looking at these events that are brewing right now. We have World War III brewing uh, in Russia, Ukraine, and us sending a lot of money over there. So as we get out of real estate, now that you understand, like the average American right now had 115% increase. If they bought a new home this year, it cost 115% more per month to be able to purchase it. Now, the average American home doesn't have bonus structures or commissions and things like that. They're, they're salary or hourly. So if the consumers drive the market, what's going on with the consumers? Consumers right now, the average American has $7,486 in credit card debt. That's the average American household. There are, there are currently 14 million households with more than $10,000 in credit card debt, which for some of you probably doesn't sound like very much. And for some of you sounds like a lot, and that's okay. Uh, but if we look at the average payment there, the average um, credit card yield right now or interest rate is 24.08, 24.08% on $10,000. Add that to the 115% increase in their mortgage payment. You now have some really, really thin households that really don't have discretionary spending. Uh, right now, the average American, or excuse me, the total American credit card, household credit card debt just broke $1 trillion. $1 trillion is in debt. So when, when a government's coming out and telling us that inflation is, oh, it dropped from 6.5 to 6.4, well, I'm sorry, if I'm a new home buyer, the inflation rate is actually 115% since, since 2020. And you can look at the price of eggs and all the destruction of egg farms around this nation. There's a big shortage in that area. Something to certainly pay attention to, especially if you like baking uh, or, or making food in general. I think eggs are the base product in about 65% of all common meals. Um, so there's, there's certainly a lot of things happening there. It's important to understand when we understand the consumer, we have to understand the regulatory and governmental environments that surround them, that create the rules that they have to play within. So let's look at what's happening in the government. Let's see what they're doing. Well, since 2008, government spending has exceeded the GDP by 200% year over year since 2008. We now have $33 trillion in, in national debt. That means that our interest payment alone to the Federal Reserve Bank is a little over 65% of our total GDP would go to pay interest. To put that in other terms, in order for you to pay your home, I say you had an interest only mortgage and you made 60, you made $100,000 a year and a 60, 60 uh, excuse me, and, and, and you had to pay off 60% uh, of your income went to pay your mortgage. You'd pay $60,000 out of 100,000 just to live in your home. That's the scenario that America is currently in. Over half of our GDP of our gross domestic product is going to pay back servicing on interest from money borrowed from Congress, from, from the Fed by con Congress that you pay back. So if we look at this cycle that we find ourselves in, we have to understand right now that discretionary spending is at a, a pretty close to an all-time low. Consumer credit card debt is by far at an all-time high. I mean, by far, the numbers aren't even close. Mortgage payments are at about a 30-year high. Interest rates are still climbing up. Uh, the Fed has come out very point blankly and said that our goal is to get to 2% inflation. Now in order, and that's by the way, and I explained this in the last webinar, 
you know, inflation, the, the, the metrics we use from a governmental standpoint to determine what, what the inflation rate in this country is, haven't changed since the 70s. So we're still tracking you know, inflation as though we lived in 1979. Uh, in 2023, many things have changed. They've been automated. There are far more monthly expenses than there were back then. Uh, everything costs more than it did back then. So the way that we track inflation is pretty flawed. It needs to be updated. No, not that I have any say in that. It's just my, my personal opinion and stats back that up. Uh, but we also have a board, and I forget the acronym. I think it's like NRBA or something like that. Uh, there's a board of nine unelected officials that their job is basically to tell us whether or not we're in a recession. Well, I don't need that board to tell me that we're in a recession because I go to the gas pump, I go to the grocery store, uh, I have tuition to pay for kids, I have a mortgage. Uh, I can tell you inflation is much higher than 6.4%. So this gives a good background for what I want to get into with natural gas. And this all has a, a very succinct, specific purpose for you. Now, getting into understanding how all of how we got here? Why are we why are we living in a reality where things cost a lot more money this year than they did last year, and way more than they did three years ago? Yet we continually hear from media and the government that everything is okay. It's only six percent more expensive. You know, we live in this strange world where what we hear is far different than what we see. And if we break these things down and think critically, we have to understand that something is wrong here. Something is not making sense. The numbers do not add up. So I'm going to go through a good systematic process for you to understand how numbers don't add up. And I'm going to begin by rewinding back to last month where I explained the latest GDP report. The next GDP report comes out on the 24th. So I'll be excited to see that, but I can probably already tell you uh, exactly how they determine their number. Uh, here's a surprise. They're going to tell you inflation is going away, uh, and it's not. Now, the last GDP report, if, if you remember, we had a, a zero a quarter, first quarter, second quarter, I think we were down a half a percentage point. Third quarter, we were down by you know, 0.2 or 0.3%. That's a representation of a shrinking economy. Either we're contracting or expanding. So if the number's positive, we're expanding. If it's negative, we're contracting. So we had two consecutive quarters of contracting economy. By definition, before the definition was changed, uh, by definition, that is a recession. So whether you like it or not, you're living in a recession, yet everyone in the media will say, oh, we might enter a recession. We're not, we not, might not enter anything. We are in a recession as we speak. Now, then we had the GDP report that came out right before the midterm elections. And if you remember me talking about this, I actually took the time to read it. I'm excited to read the next one to see what kind of uh, scam they're running in it. But if you look at the GDP report, it's the gross domestic product. That doesn't mean that it's that companies are making that money or you're making that money. It means the gross domestic product. How many goods were exchanged for money? So the last GDP report, which I'll remind you, came out right before an election, uh, an election where our president went to Saudi Arabia, fist bumped a guy, and instead of getting a, a spike in production to help offset this, the low supply of, of energy in this country, he got a reduction of 2 million barrels per day, which is now being reduced even further. So before that happened, we, I don't think any of us would, would sit back and say this economy is great. If you're, if you're living in the world right now, uh, I'm sure you're feeling the pain. And if you have enough money to not feel the pain, God bless you. But you can see it in the eyes of other people. And where we sit right now, that during this, this GDP report, if you remove the top three earners that pushed the GDP report into a positive environment, into an expansion number, number one was liquid natural gas, the largest liquid natural gas sale in the history of this nation. Uh, was set and, and shipped off to Europe. Who needs natural gas? I'm not going to say that they don't. They have many pipelines that have burst. Uh, interesting to find out who does that. But these, the, this shipment accounted for a big bulk. It actually took the GDP number from negative one point some odd uh, into a positive two point some odd. Uh, so it was a big swing from this. Here's how this works. Companies like King, uh, you know, any, any of our competitors out there, we don't sell that natural gas to Europe. We sell our natural gas into the market. So as soon as we pull it out of the ground, it goes into a pipeline, we get paid. That's the end of the story. Now, what happens when we do a domestic shipment of LNG? It means that the government harvests a bunch of this energy, a bunch of this liquid natural gas, puts it on boats, ships it over to Europe. And you know, most of you are investors in our fund. And if you're not, you certainly should talk to someone. But uh, at the same time, we sell natural gas. We drill for oil and gas. And we are going through a difficult time right now because the projected price by almost every analyst on the street for 2023 uh, had natural gas at $6 a unit. It's currently around two, two and 225. Very, very inexpensive. 
But every major economist out there has the same, and I will use this term, excuse for why the price is low. Uh, the reasoning or excuse, whatever you want to give it, is that, oh, it's not as, it's not as cold of a winter as they thought it would be in Europe. I mean, that, you know, it's something you could listen to and go, okay, well, that makes sense. But if you actually research the difference between a cold winter and a hot winter, it's about four degrees per day. So the difference between 40 degrees and 36 degrees doesn't really impact a 60% drop in the price of natural gas. It just doesn't. Uh, I've been calling other gas oil and gas companies for months to try to figure out what's happening in this space. And most people actually don't have an answer. And that's, that's a problem. So before I get into that, it's important to understand that this large sale of liquid natural gas from the GDP last time pushed us into a positive number. Okay, important to understand that. This got followed by earlier, or excuse me, in January, our jobs report came out at 517,000 new jobs. This is what our government agencies are telling us the data is. You know, trust the data. Just, just be quiet, trust the data. So they're telling us 517,000 new jobs were created. And, and, and most people ask, where are these jobs? And no one can really describe it. So in this jobs report, we also saw the 517. And if you look at ADP, who is the largest payroll provider in the, in the country, they put out their own jobs report. Their jobs report said 111,000 new jobs were created. And if you dig really deep into the jobs report and numbers, you can see PMI indices, index. There's two different index that measure manufacturing and service jobs. Uh, these indices are hard to explain. I won't get into it. But the, the PMI for, for manufacturing in a healthy economy is around 60. We're hovering just above 50, which makes sense because we've shipped off all of our, our manufacturing jobs overseas since basically 2008. So since 2008, I don't expect that number to be big, but we, what the country, what our, what our country actually is, is a service nation. You know, you can look at companies like Apple and yeah, they sell an iPhone, but that iPhone's made in China and it's sold here. That's a service. You can look at any computer, pro, any computer company out there, any electronics company out there. They're a service. They're not really a manufacturing business. They don't manufacture. They offshore that through OEMs. So if we look at the real indice that matters, you have to look at the employment PMI. The employment PMI is now around 50 as well, meaning there's just as many service jobs as manufacturing, or it's an equal unemployment rate. None of these numbers correlate with a 517,000 new job report from the government. They just don't correlate. And to prove to you that they don't correlate, the market didn't react as though it, it, it made sense. You can, you can look at about 50 different interviews online. I'll be happy to post them. You can see all kinds of people saying, I don't think this is correct because right before this report came out, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve in Philadelphia went public by saying the jobs report for Q1 in 2022 is a million jobs overstated. Meaning the government is saying there was a million jobs, but there was only 10,000 actual jobs created. So the information that's being shared out there from supposedly credible institutions does not correlate with real life. Uh, in times like this, it's important as an investor, uh, even as just an observer of an economy or observer of life, it's important to use your eyes and ears and, and gain the pers perspective you need to be able to judge whether or not these numbers are accurate. Because to be quite honest with you, none of them make sense. The latest report about retail sales that came out, our, our National Bureau, another institution telling us what the retail sales environment is, is laughable. They're telling us that retail sales are up 3% month over month and 6% year over year. Um, retail sales are very easy to observe. If you live in our area, go to Fort Worth, go to Dallas, just drive around downtown. You're going to see 50% of the retail locations are for lease. That's just what you're going to see. And then you could say, well, we live in an era of shipping and e-commerce. Fantastic. Let's look at Amazon. Amazon has lost a massive amount of market share because their profitability isn't what they projected. If you look at the earnings reports of all the retailers that happened earlier this week, there's a, there's a reason we dropped 700 points in, in the, on the Dow yesterday is because the earnings were not strong. So companies are telling us they're making less money, yet data institutions are telling us that the, that the economy is growing, that retail is growing. These are very dangerous times for an investor, for anyone. It's dangerous times for anyone. You know, in the midst of this, we have, you know, train wrecks in Ohio and, and, and Louisiana, all these other things that are happening right now. It's a very, very turbulent, volatile time. But the whole theme of what I'm going to go through today in, in the half hour we have here is I'm going to go through making sure that you understand what the real situation could be. I, again, I'm, I'm not 
the man behind the curtain here. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I'm observing uh, as I guess our kind of junior economist in here. Um, but what I see, what I'm being told from formerly credible institutions is not correlating with what happens in the marketplace itself. So let's get into liquid natural gas, an environment we want to educate you on, on oil and gas. It's very important. So oil, we have oil right now. It's below $80 a barrel. Uh, if, you, if you're a, a gas station price watcher like I am, uh, I check gas prices everywhere I go. They dropped about 26 cents today. Let's correlate that 26 cent drop with something that happened two weeks ago when the government sold another 26 million barrels from the SPR. Our government is literally using the sales of things that don't affect the actual economy. You know, when you sell natural gas to Europe, it's not like companies like King make a fortune. Because here's a little secret. Gas costs $2.25 a unit in America. It costs twenty six fifty right now in Europe. It's a pretty good business, isn't it? To buy stuff for two fifty and sell it for $26. That's how they're inflating the GDP to make people think that the economy is growing while it's shrinking. And this is probably going, not probably, this is definitely going to happen again later this week when the new GDP report comes out uh, because they have to issue these numbers. And the last thing a failing administration wants to do is to admit that they're failing. And they have proven thus far with fake jobs report numbers, uh, fake retail numbers. You can see it in, in, in the numbers with the EIA. Uh, the EIA came out the other day and dropped the price of oil by $3 by saying that there is a huge inventory build in America and we have tons of hydrocarbons available for the market. Uh, well, I called 16 to 17 of our competitors and asked them if they had a big inventory build. You know, we, we sell our oil and gas pretty much instantly as soon as we pull it out of the ground. And everyone's the same. So we're not quite sure where this big inventory build is, but it's a great story to tell to lower the price uh, of, you know, a hydrocarbon, theoretically, allegedly. So let's get into liquid natural gas, since that's a topic no one covers. Uh, is liquid natural gas important? Probably more than you think. Uh, about 38% of homes in this country run on liquid natural gas. Uh, about 68% of all manufacturing facilities run on liquid natural gas. This is a vital, crucial, important hydrocarbon in the global scheme of life. And the most interesting part of this all, when you boil it down, is that there's one piece of information the government did release that makes sense, is that natural gas, since the price is so low, they're considering using it as an alternative for coal, for power points, for the or for uh, power plants, for the electric grid. So as we sift through the ashes to try to find out what in the heck is going on in our country, um, you know, last time I talked about uh, times like this pointing towards commodities, things that actually matter, like things you can touch and, and hold in your hand, like uh, gold, silver, raw raw land, oil and gas, and stuff like Bitcoin. Uh, that stance has not changed in the last month at all. Actually, that stance has been strengthened tremendously by watching what's happening in the marketplace itself. But I want to explain, I'm not going to explain. I'm going to give you factual information to make your own determination as to what you think is going on with the price of liquid natural gas, which is probably something you've never thought about. Uh, something I rarely thought about before working in the industry. But we have this GDP report. We already said largest sale of liquid natural gas. We know that gas costs, you know, two, two, two to two fifty per unit in America, and you can sell it for twenty six, uh, sometimes thirty eight dollars last month in Europe. There's a huge margin to be had by selling liquid natural gas, American gas, to European countries right now. There's a huge profit to be made. Unfortunately, companies like ours aren't the ones making it. You know, again, we sell it right into the market. It goes to a broker, it goes in a pipeline, and then it's purchased by someone and sold by the government to another government for government profits. So why is this price so low? Well, just taking into account the GDP report, we can look at, we can look at what's happening in, in our prices and where we are right now. So the EIA comes out and says there's a big inventory build. You know, the price is going to be stable. Uh, gasoline prices at the pump where people don't realize you know, the price of petroleum and gasoline are fairly correlated, but not directly. That's being offset by 26 million barrels sold from our strategic petroleum reserve, which, by the way, if it has nothing in it, uh, we can't defend our nation in times of war. So while our president is in a, a, another continent, essentially promoting war, uh, he is also systematically draining the strategic petroleum reserve that we use in times of war. Um, very dangerous environment. But liquid natural gas, let's look at that. So we have a GDP report coming up. We have a steady decline in the price of liquid natural gas since the last GDP report. And we can tell you with certainty 
that there were 132,000 jobs lost in the tech sector in January. There's going to be about that much in February when it's all said and done. And we know that our PMI indices are at their lowest since the 40s uh, for employment rate, new job creation rates. So when you have that type of poor performance economically, a really good way to mask it is by selling big blocks of hydrocarbons to other nations for huge profit margins. That would just be a great way to compensate for a poorly performing, contracting U.S. economy. So thinking of it in that, in that sense of understanding that the information you're getting may not be correct. I'm not making any accusations or, or, or any claims or throwing any conspiracy theory. I'm throwing you facts. Let's throw into the mix the head of the Federal Reserve in Minneapolis, a guy named Neil Kashkari. Neil Kashkari in Minneapolis. Again, he's the head of the Federal Reserve in Minneapolis. In an interview, he said that the Federal Reserve's plan to offset the price or to get rid of the demand, you know, again, we're living in a green energy world. People think, people actually think that green energy next year could overcome petroleum. When every actual scientist in the world is saying we could transition into a a green world where it could support or augment or offset uh, the need for, for fossil fuels in time, 25 to 30 years down the road. So when we're looking at the difference between tomorrow and 25 to 30 years, there's a big difference there. So a lot of drilling has, has slowed down in this country. They've taken four rigs off the market. That's a really big thing, um, especially when there's a little over 300 of them. It's a good percentage that was taken off the market. When we see these types of things happening, we have to look and see what, what's the plan? What's the purpose? Well, we may have an idea for that. Neil Kashkari, Kashkari uh, came out on CNBC in an interview and said that the, you know, I'll summarize it, I'm not going to quote him, but in summary, the plan was to reduce the demand for hydrocarbons to increase the need for green energy. And the way to do that is to shrink the economy. So in a smaller economy, there's less demand for fossil fuels which would increase the ability for green energy to offset it. So I'm not going to give you my theory or what I think is happening, because I think it's pretty obvious. You have a, a, a big profit margin when you sell American gas to European countries. You have the need to mask a really failing economy from a global perspective, but especially in this country. Then you have massive amounts of inflation, high interest rates. Americans who, you know, when someone tells you the economy is doing good, you know, a good economy is not an economy where the price of a new mortgage goes up 115% in two years. A good economy is not $20 for 18 eggs. A good economy is not a scenario where people have to borrow money to buy groceries, and they're getting to a point where they can't borrow anymore, as is our government. So again, liquid natural gas, the last GDP report, we get all these reports from our data institutions telling us there's a ton of supply here, don't worry about it, it's great. Yet in our last GDP report, it was basically saved and put into a positive expansion uh, parameter by the sale of liquid natural gas. So if you want to know what's going on in natural gas, draw your own conclusion. Uh, one board can set the price in this nation and make a ton of money selling it to another nation that needs it desperately because their pipelines have been blown up. You know, there's, there's, there's a clear perspective there, especially when the head of a, one head of a Federal Reserve in Philadelphia says the jobs report is way off. And another head of a Federal Reserve basically made a Freudian slip saying that the best way to reduce demand on fossil fuels is to shrink the economy. So let's get into interest rates before we go into q and I think this is very important. So understanding interest rates. Many of you are real estate investors, as am I. And you know, I, I, I love the fund that we have right now because there's no, there's no tie to debt, no interest rate risk. But let's look at what I think. I get a lot of questions about what do you think is going to happen. So I, I will give you one prediction, what I think will happen. Uh, we're at our debt ceiling. So right now we're, we're cutting all kinds of spending that needed to be cut 20 years ago uh, to be able to afford our interest payment as a nation. By the way, think of how ridiculous this is. The most powerful, robust economy in the world has to borrow money from a federal reserve that is not part of our nation. They print the money and then they collect our taxes. One thing I can guarantee you moving forward because of interest rates and because of the debt ceiling is that taxes are definitely going to go up. When the, when the debt ceiling is met, and we are already there, they have about six months to do some, they call them extraordinary measures. Extraordinary measures means cutting spending to other countries and spending it on our own needs for the first time in years. But when we have that type of environment, the only thing left, they can no longer borrow money from Peter to pay Paul. They've got to take it from you to pay Paul. So you can guarantee taxes are going up. So oil and gas is a great fit for you, especially investing directly in the field like a, a group like ours. 
uh, you get 100% write off for your investment. It's always, always a good play to manage your taxes. But let's look at interest rates and what they're going to do. So since our debt ceiling is met, a big to do in Washington is we got to we got to raise the debt ceiling. We got to raise the debt ceiling. The only reason you need to raise raise the debt ceiling is to keep printing more money and keep spending it. That's the only proof I have. Every time the debt ceiling has been raised, been raised dozens of times, spending increases. I'm going to repeat a stat I said to you earlier. Since 2008, the government has printed and spent two times the GDP of this country. In other words, if our country made a million dollars a year, they've been spending $2 million a year since 2008. So what they want to do is raise the debt ceiling to borrow more money from the Federal Reserve, give it away to foreign nations, and then charge you more taxes to pay back their debt. That is the cycle that we are in currently. And there really is no way out of it, except for understanding it's, it's the reality we live in and preparing for it by managing your taxes. So what I think is going to happen is I think you're going to see the Federal Reserve, by the way, Kashkari said, they will continue to raise rates relentlessly until inflation is down at 2%. If they continue to raise at this pace, inflation would hit 2% in mid-2024. Now, if they continue to raise at this pace, you would see 10 or 11% mortgages by the end of this year. And those numbers may be worse. Because what I think will happen is I think you're going to see one, maybe two more quarter of a point raise on, on, on the federal interest rate. And then I think you're going to see a pause. And then I think you're going to see a tremendous amount of political pressure to eliminate the debt ceiling, to basically say, take the limit off the credit card. We want to, we want to spend your money like crazy while you pay it back. That's what we're getting into. Now, that's the extreme side. The other side could be that they just simply raise the debt ceiling. The same thing is going to occur. Now, in the midst of all this, you have a massive storm brewing across the world. You have OPEC now uh, entertaining taking uh, the, the sale of their oil in a currency that's not the US dollar. This will be the first time since the 70s that that's happened. That's how we created a global reserve currency of power by providing protection to Saudi Arabia to sell their oil uh, and using our military to protect their nation. In the last year, uh, the, the President Putin and President Xi from Russia and China respectively have met with OPEC three times. OPEC is now entertaining taking Chinese yuan in exchange for oil. Uh, every time that this has happened in places like Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq that wanted to sell their oil in non-US currencies, war occurred. It's just a historical tracking record. On top of this, you also have Iran who today started accepting Chinese yuan for oil. So these nations are entertaining the opportunity of taking other currencies except for in exchange for oil, at least just on the oil market. Again, our dollar is a petrol dollar. Uh, it is backed by oil, by Saudi Arabian oil. So if we lose this status, not only do I think we will see two consecutive rate raises, a pause, political pressure, raise the debt ceiling or eliminate it, you will see a four to $6 trillion print of money to send overseas for Ukraine or whatever it is. None of it will go to East Palestine, Ohio that has you know water and soil poisoned and people and animals dying. It won't go there, it'll go overseas and then you'll pay it back. Uh, while we're looking at this, it's important to note that during this period of time, which isn't long, you don't have to wait long, this will be in the next four to five months, if they raise the debt ceiling, you will see a print that will cause another spike in inflation, because inflation is caused by too much money circulating in the market, and then you'll have to, then you'll see interest rates really rise to try to counteract that. Hopefully, I did a good job under, uh, of explaining this vicious cycle we may find ourselves in, raise the ceiling, print more money, have to raise rates again to offset inflation. It's a really dangerous cycle. Couple that in with other nations using alternative currencies to purchase their oil, you now have the repatriation of US dollars that aren't needed overseas. So imagine they print $4 trillion for whatever purposes that they deem, and another $4 trillion comes back into the United States. It's a really difficult time. Not to, not to be doom and gloom, these are just things that are happening. Uh, but if you ask my projection, I think that we will see two, one to two rate raises, a pause, raise the debt ceiling, print more money, Inflation goes up again, and they have to raise rates even higher. That's what I see. I hope I'm wrong. I really do. I'm not trying to be a Nostradamus, a Rice Stradamus, I guess that'd be. Uh, I'm not trying to see that. So uh, couple that together with, with the environment we're in right now with high inflation, almost no discretionary spending for the American consumer. There really isn't an upside to this economy that we continually hear is growing and doing great. You know, uh, you could tell me there's 500,000 new jobs, but I don't see them. You could tell me that retail is growing 3% every month over month. But when I see 50% of the retail locations for lease, 
I'm going to think differently. You can tell me that there's too much energy in this nation and we need to send it to other places, but our SPR is at a 55 year low and we may go to war. Like that's kind of where we are. Um, so let me get into some Q&A for you guys. Hopefully it was a decent job of explaining uh, where we are uh, without being too conspiratorial or scary. Um, so again, I'm not trying to scare anyone. This is just what I see. Uh, I will stick to my convictions that in times like this, where you're seeing volatility and you know, especially the stock market, uh, if, you're, if you're investing in the stock, the stock market is primarily consumer-driven companies. So if consumers don't have money, those companies can't make profits. Uh, if I were in the stock market, which I'm not at the moment, but I'm considering buying the VIX, uh, I would buy a commodities index. I would get into real tangible goods. Invest in places that make things uh, to make it simple. You know, we produced oil and gas. We make things. Uh, most of America does not. Uh, so let me get into some questions here. Let me try to start at who was first based on time here. Um, where do you predict oil price will be in the second half of this year? You know, uh, it's a tough game to predict. Um, I don't get into it. I'll give you some analyst projections and let you make your own conclusion. Uh, I would say of the 20 analysts that I follow in the energy sector, uh, a majority of them are predicting 140, uh, 135, 140 for a barrel of oil. Right now we're at 75. Um, so we're predicting somewhere in that, in that area from the analyst perspective. I don't know that it'll get that high. Uh, it certainly could, could soar higher. Kupperman is saying $200 a barrel by the time Chinese demand fully comes online. Um, which has already started. Uh, by the way, the IEA, which is the European Data Board for Energy, uh, they've, they, they stated about three weeks ago that current supply is not even meeting current demand. So as China starts to build, build there's going to be more demand than there is supply. Uh, major companies aren't drilling. Uh, OPEC is, is, is 2 million barrels a day short. Russia just lowered their production by a half a million barrels per day. Um, these are big numbers. These are big, big numbers. So uh, where do I see oil? doesn't matter where I see it. The average analyst, if I blended them together, is probably around $118, $120 by the end of the year. Um, that, that could change overnight um, either direction. Oil and gas is very, very uh, volatile. Uh, but thank you for that good question. How does current gas price below $2 change your forecast in the Believers Project? Uh, not at all. Um, you know, for us, the Believers Project is primarily oil driven um, and it's a huge, huge reserve. So uh, again, I'm not, uh, this isn't a, a QBR about King Operating Fund. This is just a market overview. I'm happy to answer questions outside of oil and gas. It doesn't have to be specifically about us, but uh, we, are, we are actually as a, as a company right now focusing on drilling uh, oil more than gas until gas prices get leveled out. Um, it's just a systematic change. You want to be ahead of that curve and not behind it for sure. Um, Chesapeake Energy and other operators are pulling back capital and cutting down drilling rigs given the current price slump. Where do, where do King operating drilling and oil and gas stand on the strategy wise? Um, so Chesapeake Energy and some of these big energy companies, it's a, it's a misnomer to think that they're pulling back drilling operations because of the price slump. That has nothing to do with it. Um, these big publicly traded companies are not being rewarded for drilling. So as they drill and produce more oil and more revenue, their net asset value trades in the market very thin. Uh, the average public company right now is probably 65, 70% properly valued. So they're not pulling their capital out and stopping drilling. What they're doing right now is they're pulling their cash together and pulling profits uh, in order to buy back shares of their own funds. So it may look like they're doing nothing, but they're buying back ownership of their own funds so they can drive future profits without having to drill more. Um, so where do we stand on that? We're, we're a drill baby drill company. I mean, we, we continue to, if, if people all did that, there'd be no gas or oil in the world. And if we had no gas and oil in the world, we'd have no electricity. Um, we'd have nothing. We wouldn't be able to operate the, the, the country or the planet as a whole. So strategy wise with us, we're just, start, we're just focused more on drilling oil than gas right now. So we'll start focusing more on gas as prices uh, start to rise. Uh, and again, we don't know when that'll be, uh, but we are certainly more focused on petroleum than we are natural gas. Uh, is there any way that King can take advantage of the LNG arbitrage and sell overseas? Um, there's not really a way that we can sell overseas. Uh, we are doing some hedging in the funds, though. So we are, uh, we are hedging against these, uh, the, the downturn. We've actually been very successful hedging in our last fund. Um, but it's not an environment we want to get into. We're not a, a hedge fund by itself. But we will hedge with options when we see uh, things to be appropriate. Um, and we've got some really good returns with it thus far. Uh, what about current project oil and gas production? How many drills, how many barrels per day? 
again, uh, I, I, this isn't a QBR about King Oil, uh, King King Operating Oil and Gas Fund. This is just about the market. This is an educational piece. I'm not here to do a breakdown. Uh, we'll have a QBR for Fund Four or Program Four uh, in about a, about, about a couple of weeks. Uh, are you profiting and returning a good percentage to investors and artificially low market prices? Uh, we're, pretur- we're returning a percentage to investors. Um, it was much better before the drop in uh, natural gas, much better. Uh, when natural gas loses 60%, so do we. Um, so we're a victim of the low price as well, but we are still returning money to investors. We are still producing monthly income for every investor in our funds. Um, how can oil and gas figure a way out to benefit from Inflation Reduction Act? Well, the Inflation Reduction Act is not an Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is as much of a reduction in inflation act as Planned Parenthood helps people plan to have parent, to be parents. Um, it's, it's, it's completely designed to spike inflation the way that the spending is put in place. I'll give you an example. Uh, we, we also passed the infrastructure bill uh, for trillion, like a trillion three. Uh, since the inf- uh, infrastructure bill has been passed by this government, we've had planes grounded for the first time since 9-11 across the country. Uh, we've had two stalls at two different major air providers that have caused a weak backlash in booking on getting on airports. Uh, we've had two bridges collapse. We've had about 30 train derailments, uh, seven of them with hazardous materials being spilled. Uh, this money that our government has us pay back hasn't done anything of what it says. So how can oil gas figure out a way to benefit from Inflation Reduction Act? We're doing it. Um, we pr- continue to produce oil. Without it, you know, we, we fall into the abyss. Um, there's really no, the, the acts that they pass, uh, hopefully one day you guys will see the things that I've learned in uh, my time on earth here about government acts and the way that they name them versus what, uh, what they actually do. Uh, do you have any charts, charts to show us? Uh, by the way, I started in the ONG business as a geologist in 1975. Awesome. Uh, seen a lot of these. I've seen, you know, I've, I started out as a money manager 20 years ago. I've seen a lot of these economic cycles. I've never seen economic cycles coinciding with all the crazy things that we're seeing on the geopolitical scale uh, at a grand scale like we see now. Um, so thank you for that, John. That's uh, awesome that you're a geologist. Uh, I'm a huge fan of science uh, and geology is what makes oil and gas successful. So uh, thank you for your service in the business. Um, I do have some charts I can show you, but we're not, I'm not here to, to do that for you tonight. Just kind of go through market overview. Uh, I'll be happy to put some out later this week. Uh, the demand and supply are, are crossing one another. Uh, we have seen that before. Uh, I don't know if we've seen that before with so many currencies competing for a new global currency with bricks mounting across the world. I don't know that we've ever seen this much gold purchased off, uh, off the open market by central banks before. Uh, I certainly don't know that we've seen rising interest rates with rising inflation and more money printing in the middle. Um, I can't recall anything this dangerous being done. Uh, I certainly don't recall this many natural disasters occurring at the same time. Uh, you want to have you want to have a little fun tonight? Research how many volcanoes erupted in the last three years or how many earthquakes we've had is pretty astounding. Um, and I also don't remember any time like this with the threat of nuclear war. Um, and that's actually become a very real thing. Russia yesterday said they're pulling out of the um, uh, Disarmament Act uh, with us. You know, you take whatever stance you want on uh, Ukraine versus Russia. I don't pick a side. I choose peace. Um, if we had, if I had my choice with Russia and Ukraine, I would, I would say a peace treaty would be the best solution, not sending more money to one side or the other. Um, but I don't know that there's, uh, that there's ever been a cycle quite like this. There've been similar ones, uh, but not quite like this. Uh, maybe I missed it. How is the price of LNG set? That's a great question, by the way, Mark. Um, that answer is, is the generic answer is it's set by supply and demand. Uh, but how are supply and demand measured uh, with 7.8? you know, billion people on planet earth. Who, ma- who manages supply and demand? Uh, we get reports from institutions that are funded by the government that tell us numbers that set the price. Uh, and what I wanted to explain with this right now is that these numbers that our government institutions are telling us right now aren't correlating with real life. Um, so how is the price set? Like everything else in commodities is set by supply and demand. Uh, can that be manipulated? More than likely. Uh, is it being, I don't know. Uh, I have no idea, but it, it is fishy. We have a fishy, fishy environment right now, and it'll level out like everything else. Everything comes in cycles, uh, but I don't know that we've seen this many cycles coming at us in different sectors of the economy or uh, other, other areas of industry all at the same time. Uh, very, very strange point in history, but the price of liquid natural gas is generally set by supply and demand. Uh, it's just a matter of what numbers are reported by who that determine the price. 
what is the impact of the OPEC production for year 2023 together with Russia's 500,000 barrel reduction act? Uh, this is great. Um, so in order to answer this question for you, uh, Andre, um, it's very important to understand usage. So right now, America uses about 18.6 million barrels of oil per day. Um, China uses about 40% more of that because they have a much larger population. China just reopened from COVID. So you're seeing a nine stage process for fully reopening China that's in stage two. So it's very infantile. So what we're seeing right now, the estimates coming out of the Chinese demand will create a spike of about 4 million barrels a day in demand. So if you correlate that with the two uh, 2 million barrels a day by OPEC and 2.5 million barrels a day by Russia and the $1.9 billion or billion barrels a day from American deficiency, you find yourself in a situation where, where with this new demand hitting the market, we're now almost 9 million barrels per day under mentioned. Excuse me. So we're looking at an environment right now where demand can't possibly meet supply. Uh, supply can't meet demand. Uh, and that's only going to get worse. So the only way to get out of this is to continue to drill and produce more. So a lot of things have to happen in a marketplace for a big public company to get their numbers correct. But with small, small independent drillers like us, the, the solution and, and the problem are all the same. It's just continue to drill. Um, but I see that impacting the price of, of oil very steeply, uh, probably around May. Um, everything has a lag. So as the demand comes more online from China, it's usually about a two to three month lag in reporting. Uh, and I expect May to be a really... Uh, from our perspective as an oil and gas company, a really good time for us, but a really bad time for the average American consumer who's a trillion dollars in credit card debt and has 115% increase in new mortgage payments. Um, it's going to be very trying for the economy to be able to uh, to get through this without drilling. Uh, the only way to get out of an energy crisis is to drill. It's just a simple philosophy. Uh, you mentioned about Bitcoin. Are you thinking of mining Bitcoin using flare gas to run generators, which uh, Suman, Yes. Uh, that was one of the first things on my docket as chief growth officer and uh, brought a friend of mine, Michael Wade, in here, uh, and we are working on that as we speak. Um, so expect to see something from us in the, uh, the Bitcoin energy sector uh, sometime fairly soon. Uh, it's a very interesting business model, hard to iron out, um, but a very interesting business model nonetheless. So we certainly intend on that um, in the future. And I think that is all we have. Oh, seems like Pete. Ah. Mark Norman, great question. Seems like people's gas bill is much higher now, but the price of liquid natural gas is low. Is that correct? Yes, 100%, Mark, that is correct. Um, I love the critical thinking going on here. Isn't it interesting how the price of liquid natural gas is $2.20 and the average electric bill and gas bill in California is $400? Um, this is how inflation is created. Uh, you're also starting to see when people can't afford things, but companies have higher profit margins. Um, you know, make no mistake, people, people profiteer uh, off of any area they can in, 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 in this type of economy. Um, so that is a very good question. Uh, then isn't that counter to supply and demand? That doesn't make sense to me. Mark, you are now swimming in the same pool with so-called experts who give you a BS answer that it's just not as cold this winter as it was last winter. Then why is my, natural, why is my gas price in my home so expensive? Hopefully, you all can see what is happening right now in the economy surrounding your reality every single day. Uh, eventually, this will iron out. The truth will be seen. Truth will be told. Uh, until then, buckle down, buy commodities, uh, buy tangible goods, things that people need. Uh, I spoke last time a little bit about the Dodd-Frank Act and bail-ins for banks. That's not off the docket. Um, those conversations are still being had at the FDIC and all over the place talking about potential bail-ins. So watch your cash, invest in commodities, um, you know, talk to us if you're not already in the fund, talk to somebody about oil and gas uh, for the tax benefits and the monthly income. This is why I love working here at this point in time in history. We know taxes are going to go up because of government spending. That's obvious. So you get 100% tax write-off for an investment in a fund like ours, use it. Lower your taxable income, save your own money. And we produce a monthly passive income for you. So if you have extra income coming in every month, then you can help offset the cost of inflation in your own home while your money is still growing and we're still you know, in the process of developing and selling oil fields. So a uh, great place to be. Uh, thank you all for such great questions. I hopefully, hopefully I answered them for you. Again, I didn't wanna to be too, uh, too much into the uh, oil and gas fund that we're operating right now. Uh, I wanted to be more educational uh, so you could see what's happening. If you're an investor in the fund, hopefully this gives you an idea 
uh, of some low profitability uh, seasons that we'll go through. Uh, Mark, great question. You're right on the right path. Um, I don't want to say it out loud because this will be on YouTube and I don't want the government up my uh, rear end. Um, but yeah, there's something fishy going on in liquid natural gas. Uh, and I think you can all see that by now. So uh, thank you so much. This is great timing, great questions. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. God bless your families. Uh, and I hope to see you next month again. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night.